Hi everybody, welcome back. Well, I can certainly say I don't think I ever had so many quick responses on a video as I did on this last one I did on the little Hitachi turntable. Um, got a lot of good comments and yes, I will make a confession. My little makeshift high-speed turntable setup of the cartridge was borderline sacrilege. I will admit it, but Again, I just wanted this to be a very simple preliminary thing. There are definitely some other facts that I left out that I hope to be able to cover with this video because obviously <laughs> from how much interest it's generated, um, I am going to do another, at least one or two more here. Uh, the first, and, and what I am going to work on on this one is going to be the Pioneer turntable, the PL560. So. Let me show you a couple of things that I'm doing. First of all, I pulled the, this was a used turntable when I got it, and I really haven't done anything with it yet. And the first thing I wanted to do was inspect the stylus. And in order to do that, I'm using my little microscope, and you've seen it. I've used it when working on little surface mount things. Let me move you over here. And you can see my makeshift stylus inspection station. <laughs> And I have the stylus pulled out of the cartridge, and I have it mounted up in front of the camera, and you kind of have to have a white background, so I just use a piece of paper taped up to my lamp. Yep, it's pretty, pretty hokey how I've put together, but it really does work. And if we go over here, and we zoom in, right there is a picture of a stylus. So let me talk about that for a quick second. There are different types of stylus, or styli, I should say, that are used. Now the one you're looking at is called an elliptical. And we talked about that in the last video a little bit. There's conical, elliptical, and then there's the line contact, or, or micro line, shibata. There's a bunch of different names for the next generation above a standard elliptical. Now if you notice with an elliptical, you're looking at the frontal view, so the cantilever or the, or the stylus arm, okay, this is called the cantilever, that's the little arm that the stylus or the little diamond is mounted to. And so you're looking at the stylus from the front, so it's from, from it facing you, and this little part down here is the actual diamond stylus and this is called a bonded stylus as opposed to a nude stylus and we'll see why it's bonded here in a minute but what I want to bring your attention to is if you remember we had a relatively decent view of the new cartridge that I installed on that little turntable and it was a very low cost low end cartridge and it had a conical tip and you notice it was very it was very circular and came to a point. And if you notice, this one kind of caves in on the sides. You see that? That's on the frontal view. Now we're going to turn it around here in a minute and look at the side view. And <laughs> you can see all this crud. This, this stylus is worn somewhat. And you can see <laughs> this is normal. This is what these look like up close when you, when you really magnify into them. You can see all the little imperfections on the, on the metal arm and all these things. That's normal. What we're concerned about is this part down here that actually comes in contra contact with the groove. And uh, these can be cleaned a little bit better than this, but you're never going to get them absolutely perfect on a microscopic level. So let's rotate this around. We'll look at the side view now. Okay, now from the side, you can actually see the diamond a lot better. See how it's on there? And you can see from the side profile, it almost looks like a conical tip in a way. But in the front, if you noticed, it was kind of like caved in on the sides. So that's an elliptical stylus. Now why, why are all these different diamond shapes important? Well, we'll get into that here in a minute. And you can see this is called a bonded stylus. So there's a base plate here. It's hard to see because of all the crud and everything, and you really need to, this is as far as I can magnify with this camera. I would need a different lens to get in even closer. But you can see 
where the actual diamond is bonded onto a little base plate which is then bonded onto the cantilever. And this is a little bit less desirable. A nude diamond would actually have a little hole drilled right in through the cantilever and the, the diamond would be one solid piece that would go clear through like this. And uh, supposedly those give you a little better performance and so forth. I'm not a big turntable person like a lot of other folks out there. So you'll have to just take their word for it. Um, I, you know, although an elliptical nude stylus is considered a good type of uh, stylus and it's a, it's a good all around one for good quality sound. The other ones we'll get into a little bit later when we talk about different types. But I just kind of wanted to show you this. Now let's real quick take a look at that bad one that we took off of the old Hitachi. Looks a little bit different, doesn't it? <laughs> so what this is, is this is actually, you can see the tip has to totally been worn off or broken off of the stylus. So this would not work anymore. If you tried to use this on a record, you can imagine what all this gunk and everything in here would do to the actual groove of the record. So that's why we had to replace the the sty at least the stylus if not the cartridge. Now once again I did not have uh, the proper stylus for that cartridge so we had to replace the whole cartridge. Okay for the sake of comparison I just pulled the cartridge out of the turntable we just did the video on that Hitachi and that's this is the new one. A couple things to note. Uh, number one this is a nude stylus. You can see how it protrudes all the way through the, the cantilever. And it's still a very low cost one, but this is all one solid piece. This whole thing is diamond. And then this is cut into a conical shape. And you see it's just shaped like a cone. If we look at that from a frontal view, it'll look just the same as it does from the side view. It's not squished in, it's not elliptical. But for what it is, it's a decent, cartridge and a decent stylus. But that's what a new one looks like. And you can see the the plating on the cantilever hasn't been corroded yet or hasn't picked up any dirt or dust off of you know records. As soon as you start playing a lot of records and so forth on this, this will start getting all crudded up <laughs> and you'll have to clean it. But uh, I just wanted to show you what these look like. Okay, last but not least, what we have here is a, what used to be a rather expensive stylus and cartridge, um, at least uh, medium priced, I would say, from the late 1970s, early 1980s. This is new old stock, um, never been out of the box until now. And it is a, this is a special cartridge designed to play CD4 quadraphonic records. And believe it or not you do need a special cartridge and and stylus and a special setup on your turn and very critical setup on your turntable in order to be able to play those um, we can talk about quadraphonic again later on but you can see this is this one here you can see how the the stylus is cut from the side and then hopefully I can get a frontal view where you can actually see the geometry of this. So this one's really hard to get the angle on and get zoomed in enough. But you can see this is a new diamond. It goes all the way up and through the cantilever once again. And you can see how this one's cut kind of like an elliptical. But if you notice, there's facets that kind of flare out. One there and one there. It's really hard to see because I can't really get zoomed in enough. But this is called a Shibata cut, which is a, a little, it's a type of elliptical with some faceting on it, and it's designed to track the groove even further down and more accurately. And what you need is you need something like this to be able to pick up the carrier frequency. This cartridge and this stylus combination can actually, has a frequency response of up to 50 kilohertz. And this is important when you want to resolve a CD4 record because that carrier signal starts at about 30 kilohertz and goes up to about 
48 or 49 kilohertz. And that's not meant to be heard by your ear, that's meant to be picked up uh, by the demodulating circuit. When you get sync locked to that, that's what drives the four channel quadraphonic uh, information, uh, unlike a matrix type recording. So uh, these are considered higher end cartridges and higher end stylus. And uh, this is it, like I said, this is a new old stock one. You can get these styli still, they still make them, but they don't make CD4 quadraphonic uh, certified cartridges anymore. Although a lot of the higher end cartridges have these stylus and have that frequency response, so they should work just fine. They're also really, really expensive, which is not, if you can find one of these online for 30 or 50 bucks, you know, uh, new old stock somewhere, that's always the best way to go. But I thought that would just be interesting to start the video out by kind of showing you some images of what these stylus and uh, cantilever arms look like on these things. I just know how much you guys love it when I draw things. So I'm going to subject you to another drawing. It's the price you have to pay for watching my videos. <laughs> so this is my little drawing of our little mock turntable. And this circle right out here is your, represents your record. The little black dot is your spindle. And this little spiral represents the groove of the record that kind of spirals in. Now this little stick I'm using, you can see, this will be the pivot point of our tone arm. So the tone arm is the part of the record player that holds the stylus, correct? So we're going to take this here, and if I leave this in a fixed point like this, and I rotate it, you can see that it will cross the record in an arc. See that? Now, in addition, the groove of the record and the record itself is curved. So, you're, so you have a curved track. So if I move these two, if we move this angle here, we will eventually reach a spot right about here, and I'm over exaggerating everything, where this, this cantilever, remember the cantilever that holds the needle? that holds the stylus, this cantilever will be straight in line, or at least somewhat, with the groove. And then as this thing tracks in, it's going to go back out again, and it's going to be out of alignment with the groove, and then if we go in far enough again, it'll line up with another groove. So you'll have like two points where the cantilever will actually be somewhat lined up with that groove. And if you notice, it gets further away with respect to the spindle in a straight line here, and then closer. And it's, it's all geometry, and that's why I said there's different geometry setups in that last video that I said. That's what we're talking about. And typically when you align a cartridge, you're actually aligning it for two different points where it's going to have relative or, uh, parallelness to the groove. Anytime it's not at those two points, it gets progressively further and further out of alignment. And of course, whenever the groove is not lined up with the stylus and the stylus arm, you know, the cantilever, it's actually going to cause pressure on one side of the groove versus the other. And that pressure is going to cause one side of the groove to react to the stylus more than the other side. So it's actually going to cause a distortion. Now let's just stop right there with the word distortion. A lot of times when people think about the word distortion, they think of um, clipping, or you think of that static e gurgly kind of sound, you know, when you overdrive something. But really the true definition of distortion is anytime the output, at least in audio, anytime that the output is changed from the input, you have, that's called distortion. So any change 
for instance, the only thing that should happen is an amplifier should completely amplify the signal without changing it in any way. Any change is going to be called distortion. Well, because you're not perfectly lined up with the groove in certain points, this one side is going to have more influence over the stylus than this side. And because of that, it's going to change that output and that is distortion. So by aligning the cartridge in such a way that you have these two points that are about, you know, a about a little way in from this end and a little way in from this end, you'll have different regions where it'll go in and out of accuracy. Now, when I say that, you have to understand that first of all, before we talk about the different ways of aligning Whenever a record cutting lathe makes a record or cuts a record, it actually has a linear arm on it like this. And that linear arm, the stylus, the cutting stylus goes straight down. Actually, there's a little rake angle, but let's just say it goes straight down and it cuts that song straight across to minimize distortion. So it's actually linear. That's why the, you see these linear tracking turntables. They're supposed to correct for the error of this angle here with the, with the, the traditional type of turntable. Okay, but there's other disadvantages to them. We won't get into all that on this video. So the, the point at which you set these null points, these are called null points. The point at which you set that, again, is a topic of discussion and debate. Different, different null points will give you different performances throughout the course of the record. Now if you notice in addition here's the spindle and if you notice my stylus is actually tracking somewhat past the spindle and again I'm exaggerating a lot of things so you can see it. The distance from this spindle to the track of your stylus past the spindle is called your overhang. And that overhang is important when it comes to establishing those two null points. Okay, So all these things are taken into account when a turntable is designed and when you set it up. Now, luckily for us, there are some standards out there. For instance, if you buy a Pioneer turntable, almost all of the Pioneer turntables back in their heyday had the same setup, they had the same overhang, they had the same arm length. The effect, effective arm length is, and I think I'm correct on this, I'll have to check it. But basically, it's the distance from this pivot point to where the stylus meets the record. Um, they all have the same effective arm length. In other words, no matter if it's S-shaped or straight or whatever, that length is going to be very similar in all Pioneer. So if you have a Pioneer turntable, they're all going to have a similar setup to, to work optimally. Now, whenever you see these turntables, you know, with interchangeable arms and interchangeable head shells and all these things, it's because you can change this geometry here and you can change the way that that stylus tracks in this groove and the way it reacts to that, those null points and distortion points. That's very important. Some people are very critical of how their music sounds on a record. And also, when these records are cut, they take into account some, some of the record, some of the recording artists absolutely the engineers that cut these absolutely take into account those null points and they actually can put compensation in between those null points so they can make one edge of the the groove a little bit stronger than the other side when they cut it on purpose so it'll cancel out if you set up your cartridge correctly it can cancel out those those uh, bad areas uh, areas of distortion or at least minimize them so really, this is a fascinating science when you look at it. On the surface, it's a needle tracking a groove, you know, and you, think, you don't really think much about it. 
But when you get into the geometry and the science and the physics behind how this works, it's fascinating. Another thing that happens is whenever that record's rotating, not only will the groove pull the record, you know, at pull, pull the needle across or pull the stylus, but there's also that rotational force is going to cause that um, and is going to cause this uh, arm to want to track inwards. So in other words, it's going to always be pushing in against this inner groove, which again is distortion. You want it to track the center of the groove. You don't want it to be putting more pressure on this side than this side because that cantilever moving back and forth is what makes your sound. So you want to keep it centered and that's what that anti-skating is. When you saw me turn that little anti-skating knob, that actually assures that as this thing goes in, the tension on that anti-skating gets a little bit tighter and tighter and it counteracts the tendency for that stylus to want to walk in on its own. So all these things come into account on this and when we do our turntable setup you're going to see the different things. Now again there are different methods of setting those null points and they have, they're named after the individuals who, who uh, invented them or who first used them. And each one has pros and cons. People will get into all kinds of discussions over which is best. Some people will say that, you know, it depends on the material that you're listening to or the type of recording that you're listening to, what setup sounds the best. But it is pretty amazing that an analog device like this, when properly set up, when everything is done the right way, it can produce, the sound is magical. I have to say. And while I don't really subscribe to things like burning in cables and things like that, um, that that's just a personal thing, uh, you know, of mine, I do believe very much that these setups, because of the science of how these records are cut and how they work physically, they do affect to a great degree what these things sound like. A lot of people who say I listened to a record player and it sounded terrible probably didn't listen to a real record player that was set up properly. Um, and even these cheap Crosleys that people rip on, those Crosleys will have the same cartridge that I just put on that uh, Hitachi. And they have the same mechanical abilities as that Hitachi. Now they didn't don't have quite as much alignment in them, but there is some things you can adjust to make sure. And they even, a lot of them take into account these null points, believe it or not. <laughs> Cheap as they are. Now are they accurate? Can things bend and flex and move because of the cheapness of it? Absolutely. Is it going to perform like a high-end turntable? Absolutely not. But with a little bit of care and patience setting up, can you get it to perform fairly well and get a little taste of what this can sound like? Yeah, you can. So, uh, Without any further ado, I just wanted to go over this. I'm going to bring the Pioneer up on the bench and we're going to take a look at it. Okay, there she is, the PL560. And I've removed the dust cover just to make it easier, um, get it out of the way. They crack very easily and uh, I don't want it to crack. Mine's not cracked. It, it is fogged up and kind of a little bit scratched, but other than that, so let's talk about higher end turntables. So there's two different trains of thought with high end turntables. One is to use technology uh, to increase the quality of performance. The other way is to use mechanical precision. Uh, and some use a combination of both. So this particular turntable I would definitely say it's very good quality the way it's built, but it uses technology. Uh, it uses quartz phase lock loop for the speed regulation. It has both a adjustable that you can use the strobe on here and the quartz locked for the speed control. So you have best of both worlds with that, very highly regulated. This is a direct drive turntable, meaning the last one we worked on, that Hitachi, 
was a belt drive. And you saw how simple it was. A little tiny DC inexpensive motor with a spindle and a belt that wrapped around an inner ring inside the platter. And the platter wasn't very heavy. It wasn't very dense. Um, it dinged a lot when, when you touched it. And that belt actually rotated the platter. Now, belt drives nice in some ways in that some of the certain types of noise can be damped a little bit by that rubber belt. But in other ways, the belt can actually chatter a little bit and cause some imperfections like wow and flutter in your turntable. The direct drives usually have a lot more torque than the belt drives, and they have much more direct control of the speed than the belt drives, but they also, by coupling the motor to the platter, you run the risk of any motor noise is going to be directly transferred into the platter itself because the motor, some of them, the platter is the motor. In other words, underneath the platter they have the little magnets or the little coils, whatever, and then they have the, the, the little driving pole pieces arranged in an array around the inside of them and the whole platter is the motor. This one, I believe, has an actual motor that's coupled to the platter. The motor's underneath. So anyway, that's what this is. I'm probably not going to disassemble this one in this video. I don't want this video to get too ridiculously long. But what we will do is we'll go over some of the alignment procedures on a higher end turntable. Now, there are turntables that can be upwards of six figures for the cost, very expensive. And as you might, you might think that they have more technology in them than this, but really they are much simpler. A lot of them just consist of a very heavy platter can be, you know, 20, 30, 40 pounds, you know, solid metal that's this thick, you know, with a very simple belt drive and a very heavy duty, very quiet, very precision motor. And then the arm assembly is all machined. A lot of them, the pivot points will, will use like either sapphire or diamond uh, pivot joints in the, in the uh, bearings very very accurate and uh, there's all kinds you can go crazy with that sort of thing but really when you break this down if you take the electronics and the speed controls and all that stuff out this is the same thing as that Hitachi you have a tone arm you have a cartridge with a stylus you have your screws that mount it you have your alignment you have your counterweight in the back to set to set the actual tracking force and we'll talk about tracking force here in a second you have your little ring which gives you your reference for your tracking force you have your anti-skating this is for the auto return this this is a fully automatic turntable it'll pick the pick the arm up set it down on the record when it comes to the end it'll pick it up park and shut back off automatically that's what full automatic means semi-automatic just means it'll lift the arm and return it at the end of the record, but it won't put the, put the arm onto the record uh, to start it. So anyway, uh, this is an S-shaped tone arm. There are also straight tone arms. Again, another big source of, of uh, discussion, you know, the, the different types of geometries of arms. These uh, on Pioneer, they typically have everything set to a standard. So these usually have an overhang, meaning the stylus tip overhangs. If you were able to move this all the way over here, it would overhang this by, I think, somewhere around 15 millimeters is the typical overhang. I think that's what it is on these. I'd have to look it up again to remember. Um, let's see. Yeah, the overhang on these is 15 millimeters, at least for the type of setup that they use. And these ones were designed for a Stevenson type alignment or geometry. And again, <laughs> there's probably about four different geometries that are the most common. And then there are all kinds of exotic alignments that people have tried and have used to try to 
to get that accuracy and lower that distortion for the biggest portion of the record and so forth. But I'm not going to get into that because number one, I don't know as much about it as people who are really into this. This hobby is a secondary thing to me. I love the sound of vinyl, but I've never gotten into it to that degree where I could tell you all these things. So again, <laughs> there's people that know more than me. Um, I think one channel you can check out is Analog Planet and uh, Michael Fremer, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Uh, he is really, really into this sort of thing. And there's a lot of very good information that you can find on his website, uh, analogplanet.com. And I would recommend that. I've just kind of stumbled into his site. And of course, he's always put articles in like Stereophile Magazine and things like that. He's done a lot of, he's very prolific in this, in the, the world of vinyl. Check out some of his stuff. You'll, you'll learn way more than I could ever show you. So anyway, really cool on these ones is all the Pioneer head shells, you just unscrew them like this, which that's a standard head shell mount. And all you do is you take a, a caliper and you measure from this rubber grommet right here to the stylus tip. And I believe the, the one that Pioneer uses, I think, is 49 millimeters. As long as you set this from here to here, 49 millimeters, and then set this essentially in a straight line. You don't have to cantilever it at all. Almost very, very little. Uh, you're good to go. You can use all the stylus gauges and things, but you'll find out it'll fall right into place with the Stevenson alignment procedure. Now, there are some other things to take into account that are beyond this. We'll talk about that right now. So when you look at these things, you can tell they're mass produced. Even the really expensive five, six, seven hundred dollar cartridges are mass produced. They make lots of them. And because of that, no matter how much money you spend, there is going to be differences uh, from one to the other, manufacturing differences. So what I mean by that is this cantilever, how it sits in the mount. How the, how the stylus is mounted into the cantilever. Even the angle of that stylus with respect to the cantilever can be slightly different from one, car, from one stylus to the next. And even from one cartridge to the next, the way the stylus mounts in it. There can be very... You have to remember, there are differences in the thousandth of an inch range can affect the way the, the turntable sounds because of how tiny those little groove, those little waves are in the groove that make the sound. The tiniest little alignment issue will affect that sound. So even though these have a generic setup, you still have to do a little bit of extra work to make sure that this stylus is properly tracking in the groove. So we do our azimuth adjust but you also have to set your rake angle, which we're going to look at that today. This is something I've not done, so I'm going to try with you on this video. We're going to set the way that the needle or the stylus approaches the groove of the record. In other words, you don't want that stylus to be digging in like this, nor do you want it dragging behind like this. You just want a, and nor do you want it straight either because it might chatter a little bit. You want it just a little bit tilted forward like this at about a 92 degree angle. From here to here, 90 degrees would be a straight L. 92 degrees is just slightly off center. And that's how you want to do that. Unfortunately, if you change the stylus and leave everything the same, that alignment could be off because they're all a little different. And in order to adjust that, on a cheap turntable like that Hitachi, there's no adjustment for that. On my day, my turntable that's on my main system upstairs, I have a Pioneer PLX 1000. It actually has a rotational adjustment that I can actually lift the pivot point up and down of the arm, which will cause the angle of the stylus to change with respect to the record. And this one, I believe, also has this little plug comes out, I think, 
you can turn an adjustment and it will you do get a little tiny bit of movement on that if you have a turntable that does not have an adjustable height like that you have to put little shims <laughs> on your cartridge you have to shim your cartridge out a little bit to get that angle believe it or not that makes a big difference in how the record sounds it's the number one thing I think in my opinion that gets overlooked by people and by not doing it um, the record can sound bad and even with my bad ears I'm not a definitive listener to vinyl like some people but literally when I set up my PLX 1000 and I put that last cartridge on it a couple years ago I can tell you that was the number one adjustment I made that I heard the biggest difference it literally as soon as you got it at that correct tracking angle like the, the right rake angle everything kind of the the stereo separation got better the high frequency response got very nice it was it was sharp it wasn't tinny nor was it dull it was just right in there it sounded like it should it had that beautiful warm bright turntable vinyl sound and i think a lot of people miss out on that because that's the least done adjustment i think so we're going to look at that today um, another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to install that new old stock cartridge on here to make this turntable hopefully ready that if I ever do decide to do a, uh, a CD4, <laughs> uh, I don't have a CD4 decoder, but if I decide to do one, I'll have a turntable that's ready to do it. All right, let's put this mic back on. So you've seen me replace this on the other one I'm just going to remove these little wires and I'm going to replace them uh, and put the new cartridge here's the new cartridge that we looked at the stylus off of and I even have another brand new stylus for this as well that's Shibata cut it's the exact replacement for it so we have the new cartridge mounted up and it's just roughly in place and we have it set I don't know if I'm going to be able to line this up through the camera, but you can kind of see here's the back of the grommet, and here is, you can see the stylus tip, and it's just lined up at 49 millimeters, right where it needs to be. So that's going to get us very close. Now we can actually use our Stevenson gauge to line it up, and I'll show you right now how we do that. Okay, looking at the specs on this, you can see that the tracking force needs to be two grams plus or minus a half a gram and believe it or not depending upon the compliance of the of the cantilever and so forth that half a gram can actually make a difference in the performance once again and another thing is a lot of people have the uh, misunderstanding that the lighter the tracking force the better that's not necessarily true and the reason being is the way that, that a stylus tracks in a groove, the bottom of the groove is not the part that holds the information. The information is held in the sides of the groove. And as a result, you want the stylus, the tip of the stylus, to stay in contact with the bottom of the groove. Because if, it can, if it's allowed to chatter up and down, what can happen is the tip of the stylus can actually ride on the actual music portion, the, the audio portion of the groove, the sides. That's what causes excessive groove wear. Rather than it tracking in the groove, it's banging around inside the groove. So you want it to track the groove. In other words, that tip needs to stay down there. And having a little bit of extra tracking force helps that to happen. Now, on the other hand, too much tracking force and it bears down too hard on the cantilever and then the cantilever doesn't have its full range of motion to pick up the sound and that because it'll it'll damp it a little bit so you don't want a damping effect either so it's a delicate balance again the compliance of this can change from cartridge to cartridge and stylus to stylus actually from stylus to stylus so that two grams is kind of your starting point and you never want to go above or below it by more than half a gram according to this so that's what we're going to do we're going to start with two grams 
Okay, so once again we did our little card trick and we got it leveled. Now we're going to uh, begin our adjustment. Okay, first things first. We have this mounted up. I'm going to lock this down. And I'm going to take this down till it just starts to pull up. Because we want to get our tracking, our uh, weight. Now you can see that's lifting up a little bit. So I'm going to put it back down. And we're just going to move it just a little bit. Try it again. See it's still pulling up. It's starting to drop down now. I bet it's going to be really close. There you go. And I'm just kind of... This weight over here will cause it to want to drift in a little bit without any anti-skating. That's pretty close. That's floating pretty level there. See it? All right. So now that that's set, we're going to move this outer ring till it's just on zero. And then we're going to move this overall weight up to two grams, because again, we want two grams. So I'm going to go just right about on two grams. And we're going to turn this on. And we're going to very gently take this out. And I have the platter mat removed. And we're going to try to do this around the camera without hurting anything. I'm going to lift it up there. Okay, get this lined up. And we're going to set it down. 1.98 grams. That is pretty darn close. What do you think? That is very, very close. I don't know if we're going to be able to get it any closer. I'm just going to barely touch it. That might have been too much right there, even. And we're going to set it back down. One point, there it is. So that's good. We're going to leave that right there. And we're going to do our next alignment. Now, by the way, the reason that I removed the platter mat, as I said in the last video, is when you look at the thickness of the platter mat, right there, and you look at the thickness of this, it's very close. So you want to measure your measurement at the same height that the record is going to be. So by doing by removing the platter mat, you're just kind of making it a little bit closer. Actually, if you measure it higher or lower, the weight actually drifts very, very slightly. So that gets you real close. Sometimes um, with a really thick platter mat, you may need to leave it on, but usually that's pretty close. And by the way, this thing had two platter mats with it. It had this really thin one, and it had this really thick one. So anyway, that's all set. Now. The next thing we want to do is we want to check our azimuth, because if you remember, we, we roughly set this here, but we don't know if it's lined up and we don't know if it's perfect. But usually when you set that 49 millimeters, everything's going to fall into place. So the next thing we're going to do is our tangency adjustment. And we're going to make up an arc template or an arc protractor. Now before we do this, Tony's disclaimer. So we can actually use our turntable to listen to music, or we can use music to listen to our turntable. Now I'm going to set this up to listen to music on our turntable. And what I mean by that is <laughs> you can get as fussy with this as you want to. You can take hours to set this up if if your goal is to achieve perfect sound on a specific uh, record or something like that. Case in point, when, when I worked 
in college at, the, at, at an audio, high-end audio store. The owner of the store would set up a turntable in the listening room and it would take him half of a day to do it, to get it right. And it was a huge process. And his de facto record that he would listen to was Al Stewart, The Year of the Cat. He knew that, that record, he knew every track on it, uh, every single inch of that record he knew. And he knew what it sounded like when it was dialed in properly. And it was quite a complicated process. You have to remember back when, when I worked there, there were no computers, there were no electronic gadgetry. Everything was done by, you know, mechanical measuring devices, fine adjusting by hand, and then listening by ear. So, again, we're going to learn this, but you can take this as far as you want. And it just depends on what your hobby is. If your hobby is listening to music and enjoying your, your uh, enjoying it with your sound equipment, then that's great. But some people enjoy listening to their sound equipment using music. It's a different hobby. And again, that's not an insult. It is a, it's a valid hobby. Some people really enjoy that. So first thing we're going to talk about is the ARC template. So if you remember, we can use this little protractor here and it'll work just fine. But I thought I'd take this opportunity to show you this little program that I downloaded and I don't remember where I downloaded it from, but it's called the Arc Template Generator 1.16. So I'm sure if you Google search that, you'll be able to find it. It's freeware. I've had it for quite some time, so I don't remember where I got it. So in order to do this, you're gonna know, need to know a few things. First thing we need to know is the spindle to pivot distance of the tone arm. What is the spindle to pivot distance? Well, it's just, just what it says. If you look down at the turntable, this is the pivot, the center of this area. This is the spindle. And that distance from there to there is your spindle to pivot distance. Now, you, you can measure it, or you can look it up in, in the uh, instruction manual of your turntable if you have one. Usually that information is contained in there. So for instance, if we look on this one, they don't exactly give it to you straight out, but they do give you what's called the effective arm length and they give you the overhang. What is the effective arm length? Well, the effective arm length is the spindle to pivot distance plus the overhang. And the overhang is the amount of distance past the spindle that the, the, the stylus is actually overhanging. So if you could actually move that tone arm right over top of the spindle, the overhang would be the distance from the spindle to the tip of the uh, stylus. So in order to figure out what your spindle to pivot distance is, you just take your effective arm length minus the overhang, so 221 minus 15.5 millimeters, and that gives you 205.5 millimeters. So we're going to enter that in there. 205.5. Now the next thing that we need to know is our inner and outer groove radius. Those are going to be determined by which, which standard we're going to use. There's the DIN standard, the IEC standard, and the typical standard. Inner and outer groove radius is essentially the inner groove is where the music content or the, the recorded content ends on the inside of the record. And the outer groove radius is the radius of the record where the recorded content begins. So you're going to generate these two null points based on that. And if you notice, if we select DIN, it'll give you one set of coordinates. And if you use IEC, it has a different inner groove radius. And if we use typical, that just gives you some round numbers. I use DIN. That seems to be a good happy medium for all this. Now that we have that, 
there are three different types of uh, protractors that you can print with this. Each one is a different geometric pattern, you know, for your null points. And there's more, there are other ones than this, and there's some even really exotic ones. But the one that the, the Pioneer turntables seem to uh, use as a standard is the Stevenson. And some of these setups actually are quite old. They go clear back in like to the 1940s, 1950s, believe it or not. I think Stevenson's uh, version is one of the later ones and it came out something in like the mid 1960s, I think, or something like that, maybe early 70s, I don't remember. But anyway, that's a good one to use. So if you want, you can type in the name, you know, Pioneer PL560 and then hit print arc template. And I've already went through and printed it. And when it comes out, you, it comes out on a standard sheet of paper. And as long as your printer is accurate, which there is a way to verify that, then you just cut it out along the line here and you get this little curved template. Now, if you notice from here, which is the spindle, out to here, which cut off. Let me see if I can find the cutoff. Here it is. You can see where it has a pivot point. You can actually take a ruler and you can actually measure directly from that crosshair to this crosshair, and it should equal that 205.5 that uh, that you were that you typed in there. If it does, then you know that your printer is printing accurately and. Mine, surprisingly enough, dead right on to the millimeter perfect, prints out correctly. Now another thing is, these are paper, they're made to be used once and thrown away. Don't save it. The reason I say that is, what I do is I take a ruler and I go from here to here with the ruler, just a straight edge, and then I use a utility knife like this, and I cut from this edge of the circle to this edge of the circle and then I go from this edge of the circle to this edge of the circle to make kind of a cross hatch pattern. See that? So that when I push this on it is going to dead center this right to the spindle. If you don't do that it will throw the whole alignment off. It's that critical. So we're going to take this and I've not put this on a turntable yet. Once it's on there you don't want to keep taking it on and off and it's going to go right on like that and it's going to hold pretty tight. And that's it. Now what I like to do is I take a little piece of this blue painters tape. I like blue painters tape because it, the stickiness, <laughs> the adhesive doesn't come off on your turntable and ruin things, nor will it pull off like the, you know, the, the black paint here. It won't pull any of that off. This is really easy on things. So I want this turntable to sit still. So I'm just going to tape it down like this. And that'll just kind of keep it st stable while I'm working here. Now, we're all set to do our measurement. Okay, I unlatched this and I raised, raised this up. Typically, you don't want this ever to be raised up when you latch this. On this particular turntable, it's adjusted very well, so it really probably wouldn't hurt anything. But some of them, the actual uh, Q, Q bar here that lifts this up is actually just slightly above here. And when you do this, this pushes down on that, and that puts stress on the arm and on this. It's not a good thing. Plus, it puts undue stress on those bearings down there. That's bad. So just remember to drop this anytime you're going to put this lock on. I sometimes forget and lock, latch it over just because, you know, you're in a hurry and you're not thinking, but it's really a bad thing, I'll warn you. So what we're going to do now, let's get some light on the subject here, is we're going to come over here, we're going to move this over, and we're going to place this right down here on the little mark. We're going to set this down very, very, very carefully. And you can see we're right on there on that point. And what we want to do 
is you want to make sure that these tangent lines line up with the front edge of the cartridge. So I don't know if I can get in here where you can see at the correct angle, because of course if the if the camera is at too much of an angle, it's going to kind of distort your view. But I'll move down like this a little bit. Hopefully you can see what's going on. And I'll take a little flashlight because we have some shadowing. So you can see how that's on there right now. And you can see, at least from my perspective that I'm seeing, it looks like this cartridge is just rotated ever so slightly. Um, but we don't know yet. I'll have to take a look, first of all. But before I do that, I'm going to lift this up. And I'm going to bring it over here. And by the way, the anti-skate needs to be turned off when you do this so that it doesn't mess with you. And just remember to put the anti-skate back in when you're done. And it is hitting precisely on. And, and I'm banging the camera, of course. There. That really doesn't look too bad, actually, from my perspective. It looks very close. So that's point A, and here's point B, inner groove and outer groove. And I'm not on, my stylus isn't on right now. I'm not close enough to be able to get to this where I can, there. Yeah, that looks good. Looks very good. Now, the next thing you want to look at, which I'm not going to do on camera, is azimuth. And that probably won't be, won't be out. It's usually pretty close as long as the arm isn't forced. Um, what is azimuth? Well, if I turn this around like this, so azimuth would be the roll axis, this rotational axis this way. And what we want is we want that stylus to sit straight down in the groove. We don't want it to be like this in the groove and we don't want it to be like this in the groove. And what I'll say is the more accurate your stylus, like when you get into the elliptical stylus or the, the line contact stylus and so forth, the more critical that azimuth adjustment becomes. In a very low-end conical stylus, it's a little more forgiving of that. Um, conical stylus in general is going to be more forgiving than any of the other types of stylus. So I'll check that a little bit later but you need, you need an upright gauge to check that, and uh, I'll do that later. But most of these do not have much of an adjustment for that. You can torque these just a tiny little bit. There's a wee little bit of play in there before you lock the ring down, and that's about the only amount of play you get, and that's usually all you need. You probably don't need much more than that. So that's all done. Okay, so the next thing we're going to check is our rake angle. And you can see we have the microscope set. We have a record on the turntable, and we have the needle placed on the record player, on the record. And what we want to do is we just want to take a snapshot right here. And you, there's glare on the screen, so you can't see what I'm doing yet. But there's the picture, and all we're going to do is do a snapshot like that. I'm going to hit browse to get into the thing. I'm going to just shrink this out of the way for a moment. And I'm going to go and use a program called Image J. And why am I using the program called Image J? Well, 
it's a piece of software that I'm familiar with that we use at work. So, and all it really is, is it's just a viewing program uh, for images. And what we're going to do is we're going to open. And we're going to open from, let's see here. Let me find it in there. Okay. So there it is. And the first thing I want to do is I want to uh, I want to flip it around here and I want to rotate 90 degrees to the right so that gets it where we want it. I want to zoom in a little bit and then move get it centered just like that and I hope I have this at the correct angle. It's going to be a little bit difficult if I don't. Um, but it should give us the idea, if nothing else. Okay, and I'm going to use what's called the angle tool. So what we want to do is we want to go roughly in the center, like this. And we want to go to the very tip, like that. And we want to go parallel with the record as best we can. The longer we make this axis, the better. Right about there. And if you look at where we're at, I hope this zooms in. 91.49 degrees. And really the ideal rake angle for this is going to be about 92 degrees. Um, you want it to just be a little bit off off straight up and down. You want it to be just a little bit this way. You want it tilted forward. Just You don't want too much because you don't want it digging into the record and you don't want it this way because you don't want it dragging across the record nor do you want it chattering this way. You want it just slightly off axis like this just a couple of degrees and that looks pretty good. Now if that was not correct what we would have to do is we would have to go ahead and shim the back of the cartridge a little bit um, in order to give it a little more of an angle but luckily I think this will be fine. This will work just fine and that's how I do it. Now I really don't know if you don't have one of these microscope thingies um, how you would do it this is something new for me because I've never tried to do this before. I always tune this by ear. So if you look at my main turntable upstairs in my main system is a Pioneer PLX 1000. And it has a, a deck that goes up and down. Like you can rotate it and it will raise and lower the arm in order to allow the uh, to change the rake angle. So you can actually adjust the rake angle directly from there. And I, I dialed mine in by listening. In other words, this is probably the least understood alignment on a turntable. And I think it's one of the ones that has the most dramatic effect, at least on the system that I had upstairs. That turntable, until I got that rake angle optimal, you could hear the difference as soon as you hit it and it's a really narrow little uh, narrow little band that you can get it in all of a sudden the the stereo separation gets really in, really intense the the treble the higher notes sound a lot more clear they don't sound as tinny but they also sound bright that you can hear them clearly and even with my bad hearing <laughs> I could actually hear a dramatic difference. A lot of adjustments on a turntable like this, I don't hear it um, because I just don't. I, I don't listen carefully enough over enough time to records in a, in a, any sort of a fashion to be able to really hear something like that. But that was one dramatic uh, effect. So I always check it now. Um, at least by ear. This is the first time I've actually tried to use my microscope to do this and 
was pretty easy. So we'll see what it sounds like. I mean, you know, we'll put a, I'll play some records. I can't play them online. Of course, everything is copyrighted. So that's the worst part of doing a turntable video is finding vinyl that you can play. Um, it's just horrible anymore. You can't even put two seconds of anything. I swear, <laughs> radio static, they're going to try to copyright that one day. Anyhow, enough of my rant. So the turntable at this point in time is effectively set up. Now there are other adjustments always that you can do, but that's it. I mean, it's this thing set to go. And now we may have to play with that rake angle and we may have to play with the azimuth a little bit. Again, this thing was set up so that I can hopefully one day play a CD4 quadraphonic record and actually be able to resolve it. I don't know if I'm going to ever do that, but it would be really interesting. I do have a bunch of quad records, and I think I have some CD4s. I just don't have a, a demodulator, uh, you know, a decoder that we can plug in, but it would sure be nice to do. Anyway, this record needs cleaned before I really play it, or I'll gunk up my new needle. <laughs> I don't really want to do that. But uh, that's it. Okay. I'll do a needle drop here so you can just see it go. I did clean the record here. It's not spotless. It definitely needs, needs cleaned properly, but it's okay. And I can pretty much hear it over my yelling and screaming family. <laughs> hey, that's what you get. So anyway, it's good. What I'll need to do now is try it out and play it a little bit and make sure that, that it doesn't skip or anything and make sure that the anti-skate is set properly. Anti-skate is another thing that you have to set by ear. Um, if you're tracking at two grams and you set the anti-skate at two, it's definitely going to be in the ballpark. But you can actually play with that ever so slightly and once again you can get it to track more accurately in the groove and it will clean up the sound. Again, a lot of this stuff depends on the, the material you're playing. It depends on the type of stereo and speakers and everything. You know, lower end equipment, you're really not going to hear the big differences. Um, and it comes back down to, again, are you listening to music or are you listening to your turntable? Anyway, that is it. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. And maybe we'll do some more things on this before I put it all away. Uh, we'll wait and hear how the comments go on this. But uh, I hope this was informative, at least to the people that are new to turntables. People that have been doing this for a while, uh, I probably didn't do everything totally right. And I probably didn't, uh, I probably left out some things that you, that you can do. But hopefully this will get everybody an idea and the folks that really know what they're doing, maybe if some of them are watching, you can come on the comments section and kind of fill us in. So anyway, thank you again. Peace, joy, happiness, and good health to all of you. Um, I know <laughs> it's getting boring sitting around here. We, we get just enough work to get out and uh, get out of the house, but we have a couple days here and there where we're kind of idle. This was one of them. So... Uh, I had, a, had the day to do this, so I thought I would do it. Anyway, I wish you all well, and we'll be talking to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.